Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to another episode of eDiscovery After Hours. My guest this week is David Meadows from FTI Consulting. Uh, David splits his time between Chicago and Canada. We talked about how that came to be, uh, especially after growing up on a 27 acre tree farm in the middle of nowhere, Iowa. Uh, we talked about his career path, about the uh, COVID hobby that he picked up of cycling, and now he went really intense into it. <laughs> and then we talk about some of the new and exciting things that are going on with some of the technology that FTI is bringing to the market. So it's a great episode. David's a great guy. Uh, I know you're going to really like this one. Sponsor this week is Discovery Master. When you are managing document review projects, whether you've got a massive database and you want to track a subset, uh, or you just want to automate the, the QC metrics and the project metrics so your project managers don't have to, or maybe you're tracking projects across multiple instances across the globe. If you want one place to log in and see all of the document review project metrics that you have in Relativity, check out www.discoverymaster.co. Thanks for tuning in. Drink time! You don't know how to drink your whole generation. Drinks on the house. Yes, sir. Now, wait a second. Drinks are 50% off. Right. Now, now, wait a second. Double the price of everything. And I work only 16 hours a day. A union man only works eight hours a day. I belong to two unions. And now, e-discovery after hours with your host, Ryan Short. All right, David Meadows, welcome to eDiscovery After Hours. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah, I'm drinking alone today. It's the first time. I don't know how I feel about it, but you suggested old fashions and I was not going to back out. So, so, so I hope kudos. you're enjoying that. And I wish I was having one with you, but I do have a client call after this and, I, and I, <laughs> it's very important. So I want to make sure that I have my head screwed on straight. <laughs> uh, yeah, see, that's that's the magic of this thing not airing for two to three weeks after we record it is nobody knows what I have after this. And so, you know, this is just that that's this is what it's for. I love it. Uh, well, it's good to be with you. We, we were talking off camera about how you must be a glutton for punishment because your uh, your um, coworker, Michael Lalonde from FTI Canada has also joined and you still wanted to come on. So, um, yes, very brave. yeah. I, <laughs> I wasn't really sure what I was signing up for at the time, but uh, once I once I started getting to know you guys and, and learned a little bit about the organization and saw we had a connection with Butler University and everything, you know, I was like, all right, this won't be too bad. Yeah. So, all right. I, I Michael, for those who don't know, is in a Toronto area and he's he's like, hey, I want you to have uh, my, you know, my coworker, David's awesome guy, great personality. You know, you, you guys ought to have him on the show. And I was like, yeah, that'd be great. And then you're, we're connected via email. You start talking about Butler University, which for those who don't know, is a fairly small college and a fairly small city. And I'm like, who is this <laughs> random Canadian who's a kid in Butler? But it turns out you're an imposter. I am an imposter. <laughs> I only play Canadian on TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, TV and now podcasts. YouTube, exactly. I mean, it's, yeah, it's a global phenomenon. Uh, all right, so... Uh, all right. You, you split your time between, uh, is it Toronto and Chicago? Mostly Toronto. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, and, uh, where are you from originally? I'm originally from Iowa. So born and raised in Des Moines and then okay. moved slightly West of Des Moines for the bulk of my childhood. And then ultimately ended up going to Iowa state university I was a cyclone. Yeah. And then upon graduation moved to Chicago and, the rest is history. The rest is history. Uh, do you grow up? Uh, I have to ask, I have a couple of buddies from Iowa, so this is not a stereotypical question. Did you grow up on a farm? I did not grow up on a farm. Okay. All right. I, I grew up. Well, it's kind of funny because um, my dad's, this is going to age me severely here, but my dad's CD handle was tree farmer. So <laughs> we, grew up, we grew up on an acreage of 27 acres of trees um, that we had, uh, in the middle of nowhere, Iowa. So it was, it was probably half an hour West of Des Moines. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, for some reason, when I was a kid, we moved from the East side of Des Moines to this acreage in the middle of nowhere. And, um, it was, it was a horrible existence. It was great for adventures, but it was a horrible existence as a teenager because back then, um, everything was landlines. And mm. we were about a hundred feet too far away from 
everything not being a long distance phone call. So anytime I want to call my friends, it was a long distance phone call, even though they only lived like five miles away. <laughs> it, was, it was insane. <laughs> uh, I mean, I still have like dial up memories in my childhood, but that is, that's another level, you know, back to back. <laughs> you didn't have the rotary dial. Like, eh, thing would go around. <laughs> I told my wife, as our kids get older, I want to put one of those phones on like the wall in the kitchen that has like the 20, you know, foot long cord. So then you're just, your kid, you're just wrapping yourself up in circles, you know, we totally so like, I want to know who they're talking to and what they're saying. They're not going, you know, so yeah, yeah. there you go. We had that so, exact setup with the super long cord. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to ask then growing up in the, in a fairly remote setting and now having split most of your career between two very major cities, uh, you know, if, if you missed the quiet and the solitude, but when you lead in with, it was a horrible existence for a teenager. <laughs> I doubt there's much nostalgia for a 27 acre tree farm. <laughs> I, I like the solitude at times, you know, I've recently got in into cycling. So my solitude now is, is with cycling. So I have a gravel bike and I have a road bike and I kind of just go for hours on end. But um, yeah, it's nice to be able to just get out and go and, and me and my thoughts, and yeah. not have to, it's my de-stress. Uh, so you just got into that recently. That was a COVID thing that I, that I picked up in June of 2020. So I was, I've always been somewhat fit, but COVID hit. I wasn't commuting in the office anymore like everybody else. And so basically I would wake up, walk downstairs, make coffee, start working and work all day long, have dinner, go back upstairs, go to bed. And that was the <laughs> extent of my day which um, I started to go insane and decided I needed to do something different because I wasn't even getting my walks to the office or anything like that. And um, decided I wanted to get a bike, went into the bike shop, started looking at bikes, bought a road bike and um, proceeded to go crazy and spend way too much money on accessories. <laughs> so, I was going to ask what you ride because I'm also a cyclist, but maybe I'll save uh, you. I'll save your dignity yeah. and we'll just say that you know, it's, it's a nice bike. It is a nice bike. It's carbon fiber and uh, very light and fast and has all of the bells and whistles. And, and I've added more bells and whistles because it's a, it's a, it's a pretty wicked addiction. But um, yeah, so I, I went and I bought the bike and then I, I started riding and um, put in you know, a fair amount of miles. It was funny. I was texting my friend saying, how far do you go at a time? And he's like, oh, you know, maybe 30 miles. Whatever. I'm like, 30 miles. Are you crazy? That's so far. Fast forward a couple of years now. And it's like 30 miles is like an easy ride. And it's like, oh, that's nothing. I go do 30. So within like a month and a half, I did a hundred mile ride just to prove that I could do it. Wow. That's so, a big, that's, cool. that's a big ride. Yeah, so called Century Ride, and it took me six hours. So with only doing maybe a fifteen minute stop to refill my water bottles and stuff, but yeah, so it, that was a great adventure, and I've done that now three or four times. Probably now. Do you do this solo, or do you go with a person? Or that one I did solo. I haven't gotten around to because my schedule is so crazy that I'm like going at all different times of the day. Uh, I'll have a bunch of meetings cancel or something, and sometimes I'll sneak off and go do an hour or two. Uh, things will change at night or whatever. I'll go do it night, right at night. I was last summer getting up at 5 a.m. and going at 5.30. So I, I'd go for two or three hours in the morning, come back, be all uh, hopped up on my uh, adrenaline and, and go, go about my day. So last year, I put in over 7,000 miles on my bike. Wow. So, so I, man, I thought so I was a cyclist, see, I, but I, I, I retract my earlier statement. I'm a hobbyist. <laughs> 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 I got into it in, in Chicago, probably for many of the same reasons, right? It was pre COVID, but, um, you know, I was, I was fairly young out of school, wasn't making a lot of money yet, but I got a commission check and I thought, well, I could, I could walk around the block and buy a bike and, you know, uh, buying a bike once and then being able to ride it forever is a lot cheaper than having, you know, to, to, pay to go out all the, you know, every, every Friday or Saturday or whatever. So I would go on 20, 30, 40 mile rides and the bike infrastructure and the bike culture in Chicago is pretty good. I don't know what it's like in Toronto, but in Indianapolis, there's just, it, that doesn't exist. Like people here are very much like roads are for cars, get these two wheeled abominations off of them. Right. You're and, slowing me down get out of my way. <laughs> yeah. Like they're not plowed. They're not, there's potholes. Like, so I basically the only time my bike comes out now is when it's got a 
kid trailer attached to it and a couple of toddlers riding, you know, <laughs> riding my little carriage. So um, I'm pretty yeah. fortunate in Chicago and Toronto for that fact. There's there's bike lanes and bike routes all over Toronto. Um, where I live, I'm in a western suburb of Chicago called Naperville. Um, mm-hmm. It's one of the largest cities in Illinois. So they 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 have they have a great bike. little downtown in Naperville. Plug yes. for anybody who's traveling for work. Yeah, right on the river there. So yeah, yeah. it's an awesome downtown with a number of really good restaurants and, and stuff. But um, there's a couple bike paths that you can literally go at 50 miles on a bike path and never have to and barely have to touch a road. So um, I am fortunate that I can go south and stay on paved or go north and ride gravel. So it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a great location. Good for you. Now, uh, have you had any of the nightmare scenarios, right? Bent rim, broken chain, you know, a couple of flats, or have you been lucky? I don't I, curse you here. <laughs> wait, I'm knocking on wood right now because I, I have not had a flat. I haven't had a broken chain. I'm, I'm super, I'm super anal about my <laughs> bike and, and my maintenance on it. Um, to the point that I wax my chain. And so, wow. I mean, I thought, I thought oiling it every couple of rides. I was like, I'm good. I got this. <laughs> you waxing your chain? Like no, you dip it in like a vat of wax? It hot wax. Yeah. And then I pull it out and then it's good for around 400 miles. And I ha- actually have a couple chains. So I rotate through the chains to make it, yeah. make it easier, but it's super quiet and there's no wear and tear and you don't have black gunk all over it, everything. So it's, yeah, that's true. The black gunk is less than ideal. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right. You come out of Iowa state, you moved to Chicago. Um, what, what are you doing at this point? I initially started with a small um, Macintosh training center of all things. You know, the economy wasn't that great. It was uh, a position that kind of helped get me started mm-hmm. in Chicago. And from there I met a gentleman that gave me an opportunity as a IT manager at a law firm. So I was at Bates, Meckler, Bolger, and Tilson in Chicago, all of 25 years old or whatever, didn't know the foggiest about um, law firms, how they worked, what a Bates stamp was. Funny story. I mean, at the time, we we were putting Bates stamps on documents and we were Bates, Meckler, Bolger, and Tilson. And, you know, like a year later, I figured out they weren't the same thing. <laughs> 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 I just kept my mouth shut and, 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 and like did what they told me. And you're and, thinking the man, these guys are great at branding. Like they're on it. They got their name on every yeah. piece of paper. Yeah. So <laughs> I learned a tremendous amount from that. That's when I first got my introduction into litigation and we were setting up a document management system for review back in the day when they had CDs and DVD changers and all of that and set it up in a conference room. Uh, and that's when I met some guys from Arthur Anderson who then mm-hmm. said, Hey, wow, you seem like a bright guy. Would you like to come work for us? And I'm like, Holy cow. This at the time they were the big four. Yeah. Firm, yeah. Big five firm, whichever you want to call it. And so I was like, wow, this is a huge opportunity. Went to work at Arthur Anderson, worked my way up to manager and got to deal with all kinds of different types of litigations. You know, back then it was breast implant litigation, tobacco litigation, and then um, some different types of um, offer upgrades and those types of things that we had done at the time to upgrade people to, from Netware 3 to Netware 5. I mean, if anybody remembers Netware at all, like I just severely aged myself there. But um, so it was, it was fun. I learned a tremendous amount. A buddy of mine at the time had moved on to a different firm and said, hey, come over to this firm um, where, you know, it's it's a great opportunity for growth. And so... I just at the tail end of my career at, at Anderson started to teach myself how to program. So I joined up with a company by the name of Talon and they were a software development firm. They did the barnesandnoble.com website and a bunch of other things. And so it was heavy HTML development and other types of um, scripting and other things with that, along with some C sharp programming and other things. So uh, Learned a lot of that on my own by reading books and following along and, and, and laying low while I, while I learned, while I was getting paid by them to do it. And, and then the internet bubble burst. And so I had the misfortune of laying off people in the first two rounds, getting laid off myself in the third round, and then hearing about the fourth round where they completely shut down the Chicago office. So um, that was not a pleasant experience because my wife at the time was like five months pregnant. 
And we're like, oh, no, what are we going to do now? And so we were in the middle of renovating our kitchen, too. So um, so I was like, well, 911 just happened. Nobody's hiring for anything right now. I might as well finish our kitchen. So I just I've always been fairly handy. So I started finishing up all the final touches on the kitchen, doing a lot of the trim work and, and other things like that. And and got the, the kitchen mostly done. January rolled around. People realized that, okay, the world needs to continue. And they started hiring again. So then I got a job. Um, I'm trying to blink on the name of the company now. Um, but they they were um, a provider. It was a totally different thing. It was a nonprofit. So I was like, I'm done with consulting. Went to work at this nonprofit, head of IT. Ne- oh. Never say never. Spoiler alert. Done with, yeah, I'm done yeah. with consulting. Yeah, because the next job after this one was consulting. So because <laughs> I got bored. But I was the head of IT there for a couple of years, helping through a bunch of different things, learned quite a bit again, you know, even more skill sets, continued to do more programming for them. They had a custom application that they used for recognizing revenue. And so it worked through all of that and did a bunch of enhancements to the application. And then my buddy that lured me away to the software firm said, hey, why are you working at that nonprofit? You should come over to Navigant. So then I went to Navigant Consulting, worked there for seven years, did all kinds of different things, working for different companies. And, and that's when I got my introduction to the Canada space, you know, and we were, we were looking to um, bid on a project. Our Canadian team really didn't do e-discovery at the time. And so I was helping them build out that space and get everything up and running. And and um, led one of the, the, a big project for them for a merger deal that we had. And that's really when I started working in Canada and I helped them on other projects as well too. And then eventually um, after seven years, decided I needed a change from Navigant and moved on from there to, at the time, the 800 pound gorilla of e-discovery, Kroll on Track. Kroll on Track, however, was going through a number of different changes then with the new, with the new president of the company. And then they were, you know, they're doing ediscovery.com and a whole bunch of other things. And so it was, and they were owned by private equity and were we going to get sold or not? So there's a, a bit of turmoil there and um, decided this was probably not the best choice for me. And then moved to Ernst and Young and I was at Ernst and Young for about seven years, got hired to, um, build out their program in Toronto. So I built out relativity for the hosting. We built a lab, hired the team, brought everybody in, built that all out and um, was there in Toronto for about three years. And that's where, um, that's where I met my significant other. And although, so I still have the tie there to, to Canada from, from that, um, from that position, but three years in then, moved back to Chicago so I could spend more time with my kids because I was going back and forth technically, but it was such a grind with basically every week going back and forth to Toronto. And so moved back to Chicago, still supporting Toronto, but living in Chicago and um, spent about another four years or so in Chicago. And then got contacted by FTI. And I, and I, the first time they contacted me, I was like, nah, not interested. And then um, got contacted again by an re- executive recruiter, and 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 he was telling me all about this position. Didn't say who it was at, and he's like, "Oh, it's FTI," and I'm and I'm like, "Oh, really? I, go, I don't want to work for those guys." <laughs> <laughs> like they're Ringtail. Why would I want to work there? I, don't, yeah. I hate Ringtail. <laughs> <laughs> so so my ignorance showed there because they they were. Um, they had divested Ringtail. They didn't even own it anymore. Newix bought it. So they sold it off the Newix, became Newix Discover. Um, I didn't realize how vested they were in relativity and how much had changed. So they had a new um, global lead uh, and a whole bunch of other people that had come in that were that are fantastic. So I started just talking with more and more people. And I was like, this place is amazing. I, I have to work here. And literally, I interviewed with about 13 people at the time. And I loved all 13 of them. So I knew it was, it was a pretty easy decision in the end that I was going to go from Ernst and Young and move over to FTI. And it's been fantastic ever since. Just really great group of people, very supportive. Can't say enough good things. Some great new technology things that we are working on as well, which I can talk about later, but um, just 
super proud of where I'm at and the team that I work with. Yeah, I want to I want to come back at the end of the episode and, and, and give you the opportunity to tell us the latest and the greatest. Um, I will I will say I, I as an outsider's perspective, I think the job globally that FTI is doing with, you know, recruiting has been phenomenal. I mean, big names from just about every continent right. Uh, that they, yeah. that they've, that they've been able to bring in. So clearly a lot of good happening but before we go. I want to, I'm going to go back and tie up a couple of things that we've touched on briefly. First of all, we're about to start a kitchen renovation. So when are you <laughs> next in Indianapolis? <laughs> cause, cause a, a cash out fi, you know, a cash out refi was looking really good up until like three or four months ago. And now it's like this, there's going to be some sweat equity in this thing. So uh, uh, I, I will eagerly that stuff is gone now though. <laughs> that was three kids. Yeah. <laughs> and I was interested in it. So I bought all kinds of tools. Like I have these huge right angle drills and, and, and a Sawzall and I have all of this stuff, you know, cause I was like, by the time I rent it, I might as well buy it. Right. You know, and I'll have the tool at the end. So. Yeah. Uh, by the, if you get into something, you, you get in hard. It doesn't matter if it's kitchen <laughs> renovation yeah, or cycling, you know, like there's some, there's something else going on. You were, you, you told me that you were going to make an old fashioned. I can only imagine like the kind of custom acquired ingredients that would have been in that. Oh um, yeah. I've, I've got the, uh, the um, Woodford's double oaked bourbon, mm. which is amazing by the way. Anybody uh, that hasn't tried it yet, I highly recommend it. it yep. Woodford's is good, but the Woodford's double oak is way better. Um, we did a, we did a bourbon tasting in our office as a, uh, a client event a couple of months ago. Uh, it was really cool. And especially like with, with the supply chain, you know, there's shortages everywhere and, and bourbon's no different and yep. you can't just create more bourbon tomorrow. You can't just increase production today and have more on the shelves tomorrow. And so this guy's talking about like all the dynamics in the secondary market, like, Oh, this bottle used to retail for 150 and now it's going for like 275 and the secondary market's going for 450. And we're sitting here going, Oh, can I have some more? You know, like this is <laughs> exactly it was a good event. <laughs> um, all right. And then the other thing, the, uh, I'll be selfish, bring it back to Indianapolis. How in the world did your son end up at Butler of all places? And by the way, it's a great school. I don't mean to sound so shocked. Please, nobody, no Butler alumni, write to me. Take this. I work for a Butler alumnus. Okay. Uh, but it is a, it is a, an unexpected choice. How this, how this happened, and what if, what if his, what's his, his experience been, and what's, what's your impression of Indy? Uh, so how did he? So we looked at a lot of different schools. Um, he looked at our alma mater. We looked at a bunch of other schools. Went to Butler and and just walked away with like it felt like home to him. Mm -hmm. It was a, it was not a huge campus. Um, and it was very quaint, the campus that's there. It's along the river. It's just, it's, it's a beautiful campus. Yeah. Very and, pretty. Uh, yeah. It's very pretty. And, um, just started making friends right away. And it was like, he's like, this is my place. And to the point where, where he was like, I have to keep my grades up because I need to stay here because this, that's how much he loves being there. It's like one of those things, you know, he's, was he's he like, studying? He's studying management information systems. So, um, is that in the business school or is that in? Yeah, it's in the program? business school. Yeah, he it's started a, out in comp sci and quickly realized that was a little bit <laughs> more esoteric. Work yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, their business program is phenomenal, and what what I think Butler does really well. And plug for another school that flies under the radar: Ball State University in Indiana does this as well too. Butler and Ball State both really push hands-on. Like you need at least one internship to graduate. They, they bring exactly. a lot of alumni who have started companies or invested in companies back as adjuncts or pull these kids in as interns. So it's a really cool program. Yeah. The community, the network that you get from going to Butler, I think is fantastic. So I think he's going to be really well set up be because of that. And I think he has a requirement of two internships to graduate. You know, back when I went to school, it was like they could care less if he had an internship. So to me, that was, and I know, and I, you know, from my years working, I've seen how important those internships are. You know, that's yeah. the bulk of the, bulk of the uh, candidates that we have come through get offers, you know, from those internships for full-time employment once you graduate. So it's like really important that you get the internship. It also gives you some great experience, right? You get to go out and sample a couple different types of jobs, different companies, kind of see how things work. It's, it helps you make informed decisions and about what do you want to do with your career when you graduate. So, uh, yeah, I think it's, I think it's great. And he's just made so many friends. Uh, 
honestly, in high school, he had a, he had a ton of friends early on in high school, and then he became the gamer kid and kind of retreated, and he only had online friends. So, <laughs> so, um, but then he went to Butler. And he's completely come out of the shell. We're seeing postings on Instagram of him like dressed in a banana costume and his friends are in hot dog costumes and they're at the basketball game. It's like, yeah, we got on TV. And, <laughs> and it's just like, I'm like, this is so awesome. It's like, this is, this is the son that I always knew, you know, and, it's, and yeah. he like came out of his shell again. So it's, it's, I think it's fantastic. It's been really good for him. And he's got just a huge network of friends there. Yeah. They, like, they won the intramural championships in kickball or something like that. So it's, it's, it's just been a lot of fun to see him grow through that. Yeah. I will say as a basketball fan, I was, I was so disappointed to see Thad Mata go back to Butler because now he just spent his last year at Indiana, my alma mater. So now yeah. not only are we recruiting against one of the best recruiters in the country, but he just spent a year and he can tell them all the dirty secrets. <laughs> of Indiana. He's like, oh, you don't want to go there. I know why. Right. You know, so, um, but yeah, so there you go. Uh, all right. So David, let's, uh, let's pivot back to kind of where your, your career path ended. You're at FTI. Uh, so tell me wh- what's going on up there. What are you guys uh, excited about? What problems are you solving? What, what's uh, new and exciting? So a couple different things. So one of the things that I'm personally excited about is the growth of our team in Canada. So um, we've been in that market for about a year and a half now. We were there before with the Ringtail as a product, but not really on the consulting side. It was much more software driven. And um, we have now have built out the environment. We've got Relativity One, we have a lab, we have um, AWS for managing the data, all the data and everything can stay in Canada now. Great team that we've built out. We're continuing to hire. Michael's one of those folks that we hired. He runs our review business up there. So we're able to do the managed review within Canada and everything. From firm-wide though, FTI is just a fantastic place to work because of the innovation that we do. Um, one of the things that we're always looking at is like, there's a lot of uh, consolidation within the markets, review tools, everything else. But the big one is relativity. So everybody's got relativity. How do we differentiate ourselves from everybody else with relativity? But we have bright, smart people that do a great job. They're very responsive. That goes a great to a great extent, but ultimately there are new challenges that are presented to us. And one of the big ones that, I'm super proud of the work that we've done. A gentleman by the name of Tim Anderson has been really pivotal in driving this within our business is how we handle emerging data. And what do you mean by emerging data? So Slack, Teams data, um, Confluence for like project management types of tools, box data, all kinds of those types of cloud systems are constantly changing and evolving. And a lot of the data that you collect from them are, is in a weird format. And some of it's in JSON files and other things like that. You process that into relativity using the normal tools, you'll end up with a bunch of really ugly messiness that the lawyers won't really be able to read. So we've come up with some some tools and, and technology to be able to transform that information into a much more readable format. So as an example, you, you've got Teams data. It's a lot of times it's embedded within a PST with the person's email. So you extract it out, you get a PST, it's got all the team's data and all of the email in it. We're able to separate those two pieces out so that we can do the email through regular relativity processing. And then we transform the team's data and we put it into something very similar to relativity small message format. But we have the ability to turn on and turn off um, headers and footers and other people in the conversation or limit that within the viewer within relativity. So it makes it so much easier to review the content within relativity. Um, we've made a lot of progress that one of the other things that we've done recently is very tied closely to that is we've created a FTI connect tool for doing remote collections from those cloud-based services. So a lot of times you see where folks would go collect it and they would download it, then they would process through relativity and then it would get put into relativity. We're able to connect directly to the cloud services and pull it directly into relativity. So you don't have to go through real processing to get it into the relativity database. It can save you a tremendous amount of time and pain uh, with getting information from the cloud services into relativity. Um, One of the other things, and this will be the last one, is 
I'm very proud of this because I was I was asked by my boss David Grant to help lead this globally and and really it's it's not it's not me it's the team bunch of really smart people uh, including um, Sonia Chen in our UK office and a number of folks in the US that are really helping to drive this forward is our response to data breaches and how we are managing the data not just the data elements, but also the privacy components. So Sonia and her team and a number of other people on, on our team um, in the US are privacy experts. So they understand the issues around the data, what happens with the data and the notification requirements and a number of dis- different jurisdictions for that, along with some of the technology that we're using to understand what data was exposed and who are the people. A good example is, is how we're looking to handle complex Excel spreadsheets. I don't know if you've ever worked on a breach before or not, but um, a lot of times with breaches, there's some <clears throat> some messiness around the data and try and understand which PI or PHI or otherwise is within that data. All right, we know that all of this got, here's 350 gigs of information or a terabyte of data that was breached. Um, where, what are our notification requirements across that? And so, so many times you'll see there'll be an Excel spreadsheet that's got 20 different tabs in it. And you know that there are hits within them. We're trying to sift through all this information to understand what's in and what's real, what are the false positives and everything. So we're coming up with the with the capability to be able to rip those spreadsheets apart. This is kind of counter to weight normally discovery because you would want to keep them together and produce it as, as a thing. But in this case, we don't really care where the spreadsheet came from, who the custodian is or whatever. All we care about is, is there PHI or PAI or other type of privacy information within it. So really trying to figure out which sheets have information, throw the rest away that don't have the information that we're potentially interested in. So we're working through some technology to be able to do that, to make essentially new Excel files that are only one sheet. That way we can more effectively have our reviewers validate what, the, what we find with the technology and it speeds the process up dramatically. Yeah. Uh, there is a lot to unpack there. And, uh, <laughs> I, I, you, you let off by saying you have a client call, so I'll be mindful of that. So if somebody wants to learn more about, cause this technology that you meant, right. You talked about the Canadian team that you're building out, but the tech, the pieces of technology you talked about, those are global, right? Yes. Right. So if somebody wants to learn more about that, how, how can they reach you? Or who should they talk to? They can reach out to me um, at uh, david.meadows at fticonsulting.com. And I'm happy to either point you in the direction of other folks that, you know, like Tim Anderson as well and others that, and Sonia that I talked about. Uh, we do have a global presence. So if there's something somewhere else in the world, I can find the right person to connect you. But uh, yeah, definitely reach out to my email, david.meadows at fticonsulting.com. And I'm happy to, to either help you myself or point you in the right direction. Fantastic. Well, David, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for letting me drink an old fashioned. <laughs> <laughs> when you, when you return to bring the boy back to Butler in a month or two, uh, we'll make sure. I'll that have we meet up. Up and we'll have one together. <laughs> That's right. 